Hi everyone, welcome back to the History in 20 podcast, hope you're all keeping well. So carrying on from sort of the last couple of videos I've done, I'm carrying on with that theme of like the top fives or five key battles, five key people etc. And this time we're looking at five key battles of the Hundred Years War. And I've categorised these, I'll do them in chronological order so it's easy to follow. But I've categorised these as why they're so significant because um, obviously there was a lot of different battles and conflicts within the Hundred Years' War. Um, so I just thought I'd pick these five out, and I'll explain why as I go along, why these are like the five key battles of the Hundred Years' War. So to start off with a quick introduction, if you don't know what the Hundred Years' War is, it was a conflict fought between England and France for 116 years, not 100, um, from 1337 until 1453. And the war saw estimates of between 2.3 to 3.3 million people die over the course of the conflict, which, in the grand scheme of things, in given you know like the First World War, Second World War, those statistics seem like nothing. But you got to remember that the population of Europe was so much smaller back then, so it was a huge loss of life to Europe at the time. I think it was the biggest um, uh, battle that took the most deaths. Sorry. Um, until then the Thirty Years War in the 17th century which I've done a video about before and then obviously the First World War and the Second World War in the 20th century so I said it was between England and France and at this time both England and France had five kings on the throne during this period with some of them being largely remembered for their positive contributions in the conflict for their respective sides but others weren't so fortunate having been on the, having been on the receiving end of defeat on more than one occasion so this sort of podcast episode aims to like highlight, like I said earlier, the five key battles of the Hundred Years' War and state why they were so significant. So without further ado, let's get into the first battle on this list, which you might have heard me mention before in my Plantagenet's mini-series videos. It's the Battle of Cressy on the 26th of August, 1346. So it was one of the first battles of the Hundred Years' War and it was fought in what was known as the Edwardian phase of the war due to Edward the First of it, Edward the Third of England, sorry, uh, ruling and commanding during this period. So an English force of around fourteen thousand men landed in Normandy in northern France on the twelfth of July thirteen forty six and they marched northwards through the French countryside. The French king, who was Philip the Sixth, he reigned from thirteen twenty eight to thirteen fifty he heard news that an English force was traversing through his kingdom and he managed to amass a force of roughly 12,000 men. So it's worth noting that the armies were about evenly matched, a couple thousand more in Edward III's forces. So Philip's army was made up of approximately 8,000 knights, who were obviously trained soldiers, and 4,000 Genoese crossbowmen, which was a key factor in the Battle of Cressy and the Hundred Years' War as a whole, and I'll explain that in a minute. So both armies met at Cressy and Edward prepared for the French assault. So in the late afternoon of the 26th of August 1346, Philip's army actually begun the attack. So as I mentioned earlier, Philip VI had employed 4,000 Genoese crossbowmen as part of his army. On the English side though, Edward III had brought along a new weapon in medieval warfare, the longbow, and he brought 10,000 longbowmen with him. So 10,000 out of Edward III's 14,000 force were, were longbow men. So the Genoese crossbowmen led the assault but they were instantly overwhelmed by the English longbows which could not only fire further distances but they could reload faster as well which was a key component that ultimately led to the English victory at Cressy. So after the crossbowmen retreated the French mounted knights began to charge but they were showered with wave after wave of arrows and at nightfall the French withdrew completely. So the contemporary French chronicler, a guy called Jean Lebel, described the scenes of the battle in no vague terms. He said, It was found that there were nine great princes lying there, and around 1,200 knights, and a good fifteen or 16,000 others, esquires, Genoese, and others, and they found only 300 English knights dead. So it's worth mentioning that although those figures are likely an exa exaggeration on Jean Lebel's part, casualties on the French side did include some key figures, such as Charles II of Alençon, who was King Philip's brother, King John of Bohemia, who was an ally of Philip's, and Louis II of Nevers, who was another ally. So Cressy wasn't just a major turning point in the Hundred Years' War, but in medieval warfare as a whole, because it showed that the age of the mounted knight was over, and the age of the longbow was in, and also that the English supremacy at arms had been ushered in on a bloody battlefield on a hot August afternoon in France. <laughs> 
So that's why Cressy is so significant. The turning point between the longbow being introduced, which was utilised hugely throughout the Hundred Years' War, as we'll see in other battles. So number two is the Battle of Poitiers on the 19th of September 1356. So following the victory at Cressy, the Hundred Years' War had begun to turn in favour of the English. So Edward III had gone on to besiege Calais a year later, but it was actually the Battle of Poitiers on the 19th of September 1356 which really solidified the English position in the conflict. So the reason that Poitiers makes this list is because it was a classic underdog story. Estimates of between 14 to 16,000 French troops under the command of King John II, who reigned France from 1350 to 64, also known as Jean the Good, he attacked an English garrison of around 6,000 troops about five miles from the town of Poitiers in France. So, although England was still under the rule of King Edward III, it was his son, also called Edward, who commanded the English army at Poitiers. And this Edward, it's not Edward IV, he comes later, later on in the uh, 15th century, it was a guy called Edward the Black Prince, and he was called that due to the colour of his armour, the thing. Um, so, at the time Poitiers, the Black Prince was only 26 years old, and he showed his wealth of experience from an early age. So once again, the French army used crossbowmen, and failing to learn from their past experience, they were unsuccessful against the superior English longbows. So estimates of up to 7,000 members of the French army were either killed or captured, but what made Poitiers so significant is that John II, the French king himself, was captured. So, not only had Poitiers shown that the English were militarily superior, it also showed that the French had to worry for a long time. The Black Prince was only 26 and had already captured the French King. What else could he achieve in his military career, particularly if it was as long as his father's? So, both Poitiers and Cressy were key victories in the Edwardian phase of the Hundred Years' War. But for the next key conflict, we go into the 15th century to the Lancastrian phrase, because it was under the House of Lancaster, and visit one of the greatest military victories of all time, the Battle of Agincourt. So, number three on this list is the Battle of Agincourt, which took place on the 25th of October, 1415. So, it's probably one of those battles that you've heard of, whether you've studied at school or college or university, but it's one of those key turning points in English history, let alone just the Hundred Years' War. So, it's been described as one of the pivotal moments in both the Hundred Years' War and English history. So, following decades of relative peace, with the odd skirmish here and there, but nothing overtly serious, the war resumed in 1415 amid the failure and breakdown of negotiations between both sides. So this phrase of the Hundred Years' War from 1415 to its culmination in 1453 is referred to as the Lancastrian phrase due to monarchs from the House of Lancaster in England ruling the country and leading the English forces at Agincourt was King Henry V of England who reigned from 1413 to 22 and he quickly became one of the most celebrated monarchs in English history. So, during the 1415 campaign, many English troops had died from disease, so they attempted to withdraw back to Calais, which was English territory at the time, but their route back was blocked by French forces. So the numerically inferior, so that's 7,000 English to 25,000 French, nearly almost outnumbered sort of 1 to 3. Uh, the numerically inferior English forces had no option other to take on the French forces in battle near the village of Agincourt in northern France. So the conditions on the day definitely helped the English as well. Uh, there was recent bouts of heavy rain ensured that the battlefield was muddy with the contemporary French monk of Saint-Denis stating that the mud was up to the French troops' knees. Trudging through these conditions in full plate armour also meant that the troops were fatigued before they reached the battlefield. So unusually, although understandably given the circumstances for this time, the French army were not com commanded by their king, Charles VI. He reigned from 1380 to 1422 because he suffered from bouts of madness, which we presume today to be psychosis. So instead, the French forces were commanded by the constable of France, Charles d'Albret. So once again in the Hundred Years' War, longbows were still the superior weapon. This is almost a hundred years later or certainly 70 odd years later, still the superior weapon. So estimates of up to 80% of that 7,000 strong English force were longbowmen. So during the fighting, Henry V's brother, Humphrey, who was the Duke of Gloucester, had been wounded and Henry himself stood guard over his brother's body until he could be dragged to safety. A sensational act of bravery, particularly when Henry received an axe blow to his head, which knocked off part of his helmet. 
So nevertheless, he lived to tell the tale, as did the majority of the English forces. Estimates of six thousand Englishmen lost their of six hundred sorry six hundred Englishmen lost their lives at Agincourt in comparison to six thousand French, a large number of whom were members of the nobility, including Charles d'Albret and, and John the First, the Duke of Alençon. So once again, the Hundred Years' War turned in favour of the English, but it wouldn't end up staying this way because shortly after, in fourteen twenty two, Henry V died, aged only thirty five. His nine-month-old son succeeded him as King Henry VI of England. He reigned twice from 1422 to 61, then 1470 to 71, and his reign was an absolute disaster, whereas Charles VI of France died in 1422, and he was succeeded by a much stronger king, Charles VII, who reigned from 1422 to 61. And this is undoubtedly another turning point in the Hundred Years' War, and it's to the French victories that we turn next. So, battle number four on this list is the Battle of Pate, which took place on the 18th of June, 1429. So, despite the victory at Agincourt in 1415, the final years of the war turned in France's favour and led to their ultimate victory, well, penultimate victory, I suppose, at the end of the brutal 116-year campaign. So, one of the key turning points of the Hundred Years' War was the Battle of Pate, fought just north of Orleans in France. And the battle was the result of the eight-month Loire campaign led by one of the most famous medieval women of all time, Joan of Arc. So following the French victory at the Siege of Orleans on the 8th of May 1429, many of the English troops withdrew up the Loire River to reach various English garrisons dotted along its banks. The French army, who at the time were under the command of John II, Duke of Alençon, gathered supplies and besieged a number of English garrisons on their way up the Loire. So the English forces numbered about 5,000, while the French had 180 knights and were later reinforced by 1,300 men-at-arms. So the English, who were understandably confident of their longbow ta tactics at Crécy, Poitiers and Agincourt, displayed a force predominantly made up of longbowmen situated behind a barrier of sharpened stakes to offset any cavalry charges by the French. However, the English forces were ambushed by the French knights who were soon joined by a much larger band of men-at-arms and they roundly defeated the English. So approximately 100 French soldiers were dead or wounded after the Battle of Pate compared to 2,500 dead or wounded English. So in other words, about half of the English army. And the victory at Pate was so huge for the French forces it was described as what Agincourt was to the English, an underdog victory which spurred on the French forces and hugely increased morale in France. And it's to the very final battle of the Hundred Years' War that we turn at last, a victory which established French military supremacy on the continent for centuries, the Battle of Castillon. And that took place on the 17th of July, 1453. So, from the Siege of Orleans onwards, the French forces had slowly begun to take back control of their country, one garrison, then one city at a time. So by 1451, King Charles II was ready to take back his country from the English for good. So he first conquered Bordeaux, but to his surprise, the citizens of Bordeaux did not want to be ruled by the French, and this was because Bordeaux had been a part of the English Plantagenet Empire for almost three centuries, and the Bordeaux citizens identified as more English than French. So in response to Charles VII's invasion, the Bordeaux citizens sent word to the English king, Henry VI, for help. But unfortunately for the citizens of Bordeaux, their pleas fell largely on deaf ears. Henry VI was mentally ill and the early stage of what was to become the Wars of the Roses were brewing in England. However, the Earl of Shrewsbury, who was a man called John Talbot, was prepared to help and have one last push for the English at Bordeaux. So on the 17th of October 1452, he arrived at Bordeaux with a force of 3,000 men. The locals supported Talbot and his men, and revolted against the French garrisons which gave England another, albeit small, relatively unchallenged foothold in France. Charles VII obviously was outraged and he spent the winter months gathering troops for a counter-attack. Talbot received more support but was still hugely outnumbered, so in addition the French had also constructed an artillery camp outside the town of Castillon, so Talbot and his forces rushed to defend it. So initially Talbot defeated a flurry of French archers, but he was desperate to make another sudden attack. The French had predicted this and they were ready for him. The French also had cannons and a cannonball hit Talbot's horse, unhorsing Talbot and breaking his leg as he fell, pinned to the ground under his horse. French commanders surrounded the English forces, killed Talbot, and the rest of the English forces panicked and broke rank, and in the end almost 4,000 of their 6,000 soldiers were killed in the following onslaught. 
So, following a three-month siege, Bordeaux surrendered to Charles VII on the 19th of October 1453, and the Hundred Years' War finally came to an end. When the news reached Henry VI of England, he reportedly fell into a delusional state, and this was ultimately another huge turning point in English history. The mentally ill king and rival factions fighting for the throne led to one of English history's bloodiest civil conflicts, the Wars of the Roses. So I hope you enjoyed this video, it's a bit of a short one probably again, but um, just let me know what you think of this format of like top 5, top 10, because when I did the 30 years war video I know that was a bit of a struggle getting it into 20 minutes, so I thought I'd rather go for quality rather than quantity and cram everything into a 20 minute video for the 100 years war, but let me know what you think anyway, and if you like this kind of thing leave some feedback below, comment, like, subscribe etc, and I'll see you at the next one, thanks again, catch you later.